And now, from the Courser Hills Farm Studio, your host of Rock Stars of R&D, John Conway, owner and chief visioneer officer at 2015 Visioneers, where better vision brings better outcomes. Take it away, John. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks for the great surf music. <clears throat> you know, we selected that in honor of In the Pipeline, uh, which Derek uh, is the author of. So uh, great to have you on the show today, Derek. Uh, for everybody, Derek Lowe, uh, he's the uh, author and uh, opinionist on the In the Pipeline. It's a uh, pharmaceutical industry column that I'm pretty confident everyone on this call has read at one time or another. So welcome, Derek. Oh, glad to be here. Sure. It's our pleasure to have you because you're a rock star. <laughs> uh, let me see. I got to turn your video on so uh, everyone can see it. There we go. Um, let's just go through real quick. I have a couple sponsors like Kurt, who's uh, an author. Uh, as you can hear his guitar playing, he can pick up a guitar and play anything anytime. Um, and he does virtual lessons. Uh, he does a great job. Thanks, Kurt. We have Black Sea Jewelers, who uh, is a sponsor of the show. And uh, if you call them, you'll get a discount. Uh, I work with them because I make some of these pens with them. They do the jewelry work and I uh, I do the wood turning and things like that. And then we have Sapio Sciences, who is a platform science provider that uh, has built a LIM, ZLN, and SDMS environment. So thanks, Sapio. And then Solutions for Health. If you're into nutritional alternatives uh, and you want to get some advice or see if they have what you're looking for, give them a shout. I'll stop sharing that. Awesome. And then we'll get started. So again, welcome, Derek. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, just wanted to say thanks for taking the time and uh, we'll get started. Do you have any questions? I'll throw you off. Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's uh, just plow ahead. Okay. All right, great. So, so Derek, uh, you know, it's, it's a very similar format and I've gotten a lot of feedback on it. People really like to hear about the person behind the pen, behind the science, and uh, where did it all start? Where, where were you born, raised? Tell us about your childhood. Sure. Well, I actually come from a small town in Arkansas over on the Mississippi Delta. I mean, if, um, if Memphis, Tennessee were a city state, like in ancient Greece or, or medieval Italy, we would have been part of Memphis because if you wanted anything that wasn't available in Harrisburg, Arkansas, and that was a, a long list, you drove to Jonesboro, Arkansas, and you exhausted Jonesboro's possibilities pretty quickly. And after that, you went on to Memphis, about 60 miles away. So Mississippi Delta, um, a lot of rice, cotton, and soybeans being farmed. Um, I was showing my kids not too long ago, one of my old high school yearbooks. You look in the back of it where they have all the advertisements trying to help pay for the yearbook. And it's tractor supply places and grain elevators and crop duster services and stuff like that. So that's where I grew up, a town of about oh, 2,000 people. Sounds really interesting. Now, did you have Not a really, Tom, no. Tom Sawyer type of <laughs> uh, childhood where you were out and about and exploring all the areas around you? Or were you more of a, a bookworm? Where, what, what, a little of what each. Doing? A little of each. Yeah. I mean, there was not a heck of a lot to explore out there because it was just flatlands and fields stretching off from, from around where our house was. We were on the edge of town. Not that that means much for a town of 2,000 people. The pavement stopped about 50 yards past our house. But I was out and around because um, I was always kind of cycling through different sorts of hobbies and projects and sciences. And these things would come around. I'd do one for a while, then I'd wander into another. And that would be, you know, chemistry type experiments. I had a chemistry set out in, the, in a shop building out in the back, which was a good location. Um, had a, a little refractor telescope, so I'd do astronomy. My father bought me a pretty nice microscope from a pawn shop over by the University of Tennessee Dental School. So I would, you know, do things with the microscope and I would just kind of go through various projects and phases like that. 
I'd be trying to build gliders or I'd be trying to do electrochemistry and see what things I could plate or I'd be raising weird kinds of pond microorganisms and seeing what I could do with them. So there's always something. Yeah, now that sounds that sounds interesting and sounds similar to my uh, my childhood. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So any uh, early yeah. influencers in your life? Any people that you looked up to that kind of guided you or got you interested in things like that? Yeah, you know, when you look back on stuff like this, things seem more deterministic than they really were at the time. Right. I didn't even know that I was going to be a science major when I went to college. I wasn't a hundred percent sure. And that seems weird because now looking back, it seems like there is no other choice. Come on, what are you talking about? Right. But I didn't know. And I wasn't, and if it were science, I wasn't sure if I was going to go into chemistry or biology. It just sort of wandered into stuff. But I was always reading and there was no internet. This is the 1970s. I mean, I went off to college in 79. So there, I guess a lot of this stuff just was sort of a self-starter type thing with me. It were things I was interested in, things I liked, and I just read up on whatever I could find, which was sometimes not very much. Um, I would see some weird microorganism and think, oh my gosh, what is that? That's not in any book I have, not in anything we've got on the shelf, not in anything down at the county library. So there you are. The next library once you exhausted the points at County Library was 30 miles away. And I guess all this kind of brings up something that um, I saw on a webcomic one time. It showed these two characters sitting on a front porch and the thing was titled Before the Internet. <laughs> and one of them says, you know, I read something the other day that was really interesting. I'd like to know more about it. And the other says, wow, that's too bad. <laughs> so that sometimes my childhood was like that. Yeah. But there was not any one special person that I can think of that put me on this path. My father and my mother are always very encouraging. My father was a dentist and my mother had, had gone to dental school as well and was a hygienist. And my father had actually done a little chemistry back when he first got out of college, but it wasn't like he said, you're going to be a chemist. Of course, he didn't say you're going to be a dentist either. So that was good. right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's interesting. No, but it sounds like you had that curiosity, right? You were always yeah. tinkering and, and Absolutely. trying to understand and explore things. And I think that yeah. is a, not for everyone, but it is a common theme. I think people yeah, do, think right. people do mature differently and things like that. But I have noticed that a lot of times when you have that curiosity as a child, a lot of times it follows through and, and sometimes you get blinded by the curiosity and you can't get enough of all different types of things. And, and I'll, I'll wait to ask you that question because I'm sure something, you know, popped in your brain when you're doing what you do now and, and it's all probably come together at some point or has taught you maybe how to explore things better or differently. Mm. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely get to that. Okay. So yeah, I was always just, you know, trying out different things. And to be honest, I still have the microscope. It's in fact, in this room back over in a corner over there, I still have the microscope. I have a much larger telescope. I had it out just two nights ago and I do the what chemistry. What kind of telescope do you have? Do you have a I, Dobsonian or do you have? Yeah, it's a big old Dobsonian. Uh, this one I bought about three years ago. I'd had an 11 inch Dob for about 10 years and mm -hmm. I bought an 18 inch. Wow. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a cantankerous thing, but when it works, it works great. So in the 20 years where I live, when I had got my first Dobsonian, the, you know, it was like being out in the ocean, stars everywhere. But in, within the 20 years, the light pollution over the past 20 mm. years has really changed and gotten much, much worse since I moved here. So yep. we don't really use it as much as we used to. So. Yeah, well, in my case, I didn't, of course, realize what I had in the 70s in a small town in Arkansas. Those are the <laughs> darkest skies I've ever lived under. But I also spent like eight years living in northern New Jersey. So after that, everywhere looks like the rim of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> exactly. I'm not too mm -hmm. far from you. So this is this is exactly and I and yeah. when we moved here, we lived out in the middle of nowhere. But the urban sprawl is, is kicked in yeah. definitely. Oh, where I lived in New Jersey, every night of the year, you could stand out in an open field and read a newspaper under the sky. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually a shame because I don't think people really know what the sky looks like most of their life. 100% agree.
Oh, that's interesting. So, uh, so, so where, where from there? What, what, uh, what, how did you make some of the decisions you made? Yeah. Well, I went on to a liberal arts school called Hendricks College and sort of slid into being a science major because I looked at the courses and I thought, you know, these are the ones I want to take. And they turned out to be the kind of chemistry, biology stuff. And I just kept on with the chemistry. It seemed fine to me. Um, I think my high school teachers were actually waiting to see what was going to happen to me because I had never really exerted myself in the slightest all the way through high school. I can well remember, and actually at a class reunion 20 years later, someone reminded me of this, but I can well remember wandering into a math class and seeing everyone taking stuff off the desk and turning to the girl next to me, her name is Janice, and saying, what's, what's up? And she said, we have a test. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh yeah, okay. So that's how I did high school. Yeah. But yeah. You, you cannot get through college like that. And I found- That is the um, number one lesson that I tell people because <laughs> I have a similar oh, really? stories as you. And I, I remind people, I don't care how smart you are. If you go to a school where they're there to challenge you, Yeah you have to work hard, yeah. you know, 99% of the people, there's always some brilliant people that are just off yeah. the charts, but. Well, I definitely, I definitely had to put in a lot more work in college, but especially, you know, when I got into things like I was taking my first calculus courses and it hit me rather rapidly that some of my fellow students who had gone to say Little Rock Central High had already had everything in the first semester of calculus. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen any of that stuff. So I was like, ooh, okay, I had a little catching up to do. So I did have to dog paddle faster. However, it was only until my first year of grad school, when I was still taking classes that first year, I took a course in optical spectroscopy. I did not want to, but I had to. Short course in that. And the professor got up and was talking about symmetry and group theory and vibrational modes. And that, that was the first time I ever listened to a classroom presentation where I only understood the common parts of speech, A and B, <laughs> nothing past that. That was the first time it ever happened to me. So I had to get all the way to grad school before I could not pick it up as I was hearing it. Right. And I did not like the sensation at all. I was like, wow, man, they always told me this was going to happen and yeah. it is. So after I got out of that class that, that morning, I went off and got two or three more books out of the chemistry library, including Harry Gray's book, which they said was the first book on group theory that you could read in bed without a pencil in your hand. And I did not go to bed myself that night until I understood what the hell the professor had been talking about. So that's the only time that happened. Interesting. No, that's, uh, I remember walking into a, uh, that was, uh, actually it was a freshman or second or third, second year of physics. And our professor at Penn State said, if you can get an A in my class, you can get an A anywhere in the world. Okay. And he wasn't joking. He wasn't <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. And half the class was gone within a week, so. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did have to work, you know, a little more there. But it's a good thing that my first year of grad school was the last time I was taking classes because I was getting, I was getting worse and worse at taking classes. Mm -hmm. I was getting worse at sitting through lectures, at taking notes in lectures, and at studying for tests. So it was a, a good thing that that was finishing up right around then. Uh, one of my grad school professors actually called me in that, that first semester because he noticed that I had stopped taking notes in his class. And he naturally enough wanted to know why that was. And I couldn't tell him the truth. The truth was that his lectures never actually triggered any note-taking impulse in my hand because they wandered and rambled so much. Yeah. Couldn't tell him that. So I, I gave him some line about how I found that I could pay more attention when I wasn't having to concentrate on getting all the stuff down. And he looked at me knowing how useful that explanation was. He said, I see. And then the, uh, the next class, I'm sitting there not taking notes, thinking about something else, lunch or whatever. 
And he's up there deriving an equation on the board and he said, and then you do this and dividing by this term to account for the vendor world. And then does this look okay to you, Derek? <laughs> and I went, whoosh, whoosh, you know, back to yep. reality. I said, hmm, no mistakes that I can see, <laughs> which was true. I couldn't have told you if there was a mistake. And he looked at me for a minute. He said, fine. <laughs> As long as I got great, good grades in his class, I guess he didn't care. Right. So you, what did you go to grad school for? What was your Duke. PhD in? Went to Duke and I did um, organic synthesis, real solid natural products, total synthesis stuff. I ended up working on, a, on an antibiotic molecule called rosaramycin. It's an 18 membered ring. And it's originally isolated from some bacterium that was discovered in the soil of a golf course in Texas. And many were the times that I was up there at two o'clock in the morning working on this stupid molecule, thinking that out in Texas somewhere, there were bacteria sitting under the fairway on the 16th you know, hole that were making this compound at room temperature in water without even thinking about it. And here I was in my third or fourth year of trying to get it done. It humbles you, doesn't it? It's it like, does. how, how can it be so simple for one thing, but yet absolutely difficult for us? Yep, they're doing it in their spare time. They have lots of other important bacteria business, but you know, every so often they crank out a oh, I lost your volume. molecules of rosaromycin. So yeah, yeah, I did grad school at Duke and that was like anyone's grad school experience. That was kind of an experience. I mean, there were times where I got extremely sick of the project that I was on and was just desperate to go do something else somewhere else. And that actually helped because, you know, like any science graduate department, you see some people who have gotten, frankly, a little bit too comfortable where they are and get kind of stuck and never quite seemed to be able to write that dissertation and leave. There was a guy when right. I got to Duke who was like a fourth year grad student. He's getting ready to finish and write up. When I left four and a half years later, he was still there. He was getting ready to finish and write up. It gave me yeah. the shivers. Yeah, no, I know. I, uh, when I was in undergrad at Penn State, I, I met people that were there for 10 years in the molecular biology department. And I've worked with some folks that took 10 years to get through their PhD. And, oh my. Yeah, that's yeah. a long time. It's grim. I mean, biology works people for more years than chemistry does, but at some point, I mean, with my own, with my own chemistry degree, honestly, I gotta tell this story because I was working on this molecule, trying to finish it. It was tough, but in the fall of 87, I was starting the biggest batch of starting material I'd ever made. Great big old bucket. And I thought, this is going to be the batch that gets me out of grad school. I'm going to finish this molecule. This is it. So I was literally stirring the first step in a bucket because we didn't have any glassware large enough for me to make this compound. So I made this and I thought, you know, this is going to be the last time I make these intermediates because it was a long sequence. It was like 27 steps by that time really hauling a lot of manure up the side of the mountain. But I thought I'm never going to make these again. So I need to get my physical characterization data, which you need for your chemistry dissertation, all the melting points and infrared and elemental combustion analysis, all that stuff. So I started getting that together. And of course, I, I went over to one of our 1987 Macintosh computers, little Mac SE, and started writing it into Word 3.02. And then I thought, you know, I should write in the experimental procedures because those aren't changing. Let's go ahead and do that. So I started writing that. And I started putting in the pictures of the compounds over them. And I realized as I was doing that step after step that I was actually writing the experimental section of my dissertation. Right. And then it hit me, you know, I could write up the middle part where I talk about the synthetic plan and why we're doing it like this. That's not going to change. So I started writing that. Then after a few more weeks, it hit me, you know, I could start writing the intro. That's not going to change. So I started doing that. As I kept going, we're getting into the spring now. I started this back in like October, November. We're getting into the spring 
and it's becoming clear that I'm running out of compound. I'm not going to finish my molecule. Uh. So I thought and thought, and finally I gathered my courage and I went in to talk to my PhD advisor. And I said, you know what? We reached the point of diminishing returns. If the idea was to train me, I've been trained. I'm not going to learn anything more by making starting material six more times, et cetera. So he looks at me and he didn't take it well. He said, so you're telling me all this work we've done has just been wasted. I said, no, you know, you know if, we're, if we're going to publish, it will just say approaches to rather than synthesis of. And he said, you should worry about that more than me. I have enough papers with my name on them. <laughs> so we went back and forth like that for a while. And finally, he says, so when would you be thinking about defending? I said, I was thinking early part of the summer. And he said, that's ridiculous. You would have had to start writing your dissertation by now. I said, since you mentioned that. <laughs> and I reached down and pulled out a big stack of my dissertation, which I had written. I had hit print that morning and I handed it to him. He looks at me. We were not on good terms by this time. He looks at me and says, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised and starts leafing through it. And I'll never forget this part. He says, you, you. And I remember sitting there thinking, I wonder how this sentence ends. <laughs> Is it going to be, you fool, you're living in a dream world, go back and finish your goddamn molecule? He said, you, you're, you're going to have to number these pages for me. And I said, I, yeah, I, 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 can, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, I'll get, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll get you a copy with the page numbers on it. And he agreed to look at it and I hustled out of there and I was walking down the hall saying, I think I'm out of here. And I was. Yeah. So that's a, uh, it's a, uh... Don't procrastinate. That's part of your, if no. you do, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Exactly. When I go and give talks at universities now to graduate departments, I tell them, look, never forget the object of going to grad school is to not go to grad school. The object is to get out. I tell them, get out as soon as you honorably can without pissing people off. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. So I'm you got out. out. You got out. Did you? How much time did you take off, or did you end up starting somewhere? Where did you go after grad school? I did a postdoc, and I did a postdoc in Germany. And at the time, this is '88. There were two Germanys, so I was <laughs> in West Germany, of course. And it was a Humboldt Fellowship, and a professor there in Duke's chemistry department had just done a Humboldt thing, and he said, "Hey, you should try them. They have funding." because everyone was writing to me saying, sure, if you've got your own funding, come on down. You can be a postdoc with me. So I looked into it and I joined a lab in Darmstadt at the time, Bernd Giese, I think is now retired, free radical chemist, love interesting stuff and enjoyed it. Um, I, I liked living in Europe for the year. I picked up some German and did a lot of traveling around. The Germans do not work nights and weekends if they can absolutely help it. So I, I gradually decompressed and got back to a little bit more normal frame of mind. Frankly, grad school had worried me. Uh -huh. I was worried that it had actually destroyed my ability to enjoy science. So you think you might've burned out a little bit? I was, so. I was afraid I'd burned out more than a little. Yeah. But the year in Germany helped a lot because I really had to learn what to do on nights and weekends because my answer for five years had been go to the lab, go to the lab, go to the lab. If any time I did anything while I was in grad school that wasn't lab work, you know, I'd go out to see a movie and I think, well, you just added two hours to your time at, in grad school, didn't you? Yeah. All right. So, I mean, there's a little bit of a story into that too. And it's like, how do you find that harmony or that peace? Right. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a mindset. You got to, and time management and all those things come with it, but uh, yeah. you got to figure out how to enjoy your time as much as possible, wherever you're at. Exactly. And get stuff done because that's one thing that's helped out in the industry is that in grad school, I would be up there, you know, 12 and 15 and umpteen hours a day, but I wouldn't get a solid 15 hours of work done. Right. No one can't, your brain can't do it. No yeah. one's brain can do that for very long. So a lot of the time would just be kind of wasted or not spent very well. Whereas if you're working in industry and you know that you're coming in around this time of the morning, you're leaving around this time of the afternoon, you plan better. 
and you use your time more wisely. Now, that doesn't mean I have beautifully used every hour I've spent in industry. Ha, I have not. But I've done a lot better job budgeting my time because I know it's finite. And I know that there's a point I'm leaving and I need to get this stuff set up and going before I leave, rather than just letting it drag seven and eight and nine, midnight, and oh crap, I never did set that up, did I? Right. What was it? Was there a difference between labs in Germany versus labs in the US? And the reason I ask that is remember in the 80s as a kid, one of my parents' friends coming home, being in a lab in Germany and saying, oh. whoa totally different than here. I mean, from a safety perspective, et cetera, what was your experience like? There was some of that. Yeah. The, um, the laboratory building was reasonably new. It wasn't this ancient decrepit thing by any means, but it had no air conditioning because okay. Germany, a lot of places just did not have air conditioning. It needed it a few times, but most of the time it didn't get hot enough. You'd open the window. We didn't have any windows to open in Duke's chemistry department. We were a windowless cave and so you'd open a window and every so often the breeze would come up and blow your papers off the desk and into the hall. The conditions were more crowded. The hoods were smaller. The benches were smaller. People were stuffed together, sharing more space. It would, could be trickier to get supplies. Um, I remember at one point I was doing some photochemistry, free radical photochemistry. And I needed something to filter light. Well, we didn't have the money to buy fancy filters for this, you know, regular, just low pressure UV thing we had, high pressure UV thing we had. We didn't have that. But I realized reading the literature, you could get some filter cutoffs with uh, different silver salts, silver bromide and silver nitrate in different ratios. So that we had plenty of. So I thought, great, I'll just run that as the cooling water around this, this, you know, lamp, but I need a pump to do that because I want to recirculate. We don't have anything like that. So I went and asked the guy and he said, oh yes, here, you should fill out this form and this form we should get to you in six weeks. And I thought, that's just some bullshit. I got in my car and I drove to the pet store <laughs> bought a in Darmstadt and bought a low aquarium pump, submersible <laughs> aquarium pump, came back and set it up. So this guy comes by around two o'clock. He says, do you have the forms ready? And I said, check it out. And there was my aquarium pump. My reaction was already going. And I had kind of gilded the lily a bit because I'd cut the cardboard box that had all the tropical fish drawings on it and pasted it around the lamp. And he looked at it for a minute and just kind of shook his head and walked off. And for the rest of the afternoon, I had people coming in and looking at my hood because word had gotten around about the crazy American and his fish tank. Right. Pretty cool. So you, so you survived that that tour duty yep. and then and then what did you do well i sent a bunch of letters and again we're talking about 1989 here primitive days i sent a bunch of actual physical resumes and letters out to drug companies that were advertising in cne news which is where you went at the time uh -huh. that was where all the ads were and i just went back over the last few weeks or months of cne news and sent resumes and cover letters to every single pharmaceutical company I could find. I'd been thinking about going into academia, but there weren't any jobs showing up that were the kind I wanted. I did not want to go off to a big research-driven school and fight for tenure. I would have rather gone off and taught at a liberal arts size school like the one I went to, but there weren't any that really looked appealing. Uh -huh. So I had friends from my graduate school group who had already gone to industry, and I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll do this. Well, I should have taken all those CVs and thrown them in a pond because there was zero response because they all came with German postmarks and on A4 paper. And everyone just immediately trashed them as soon as they saw them. So when I, I realized what was happening and I got everything ready to go and mailed the stuff the first week I was back in the States and then the phone started to ring. Right. Got it. So I got a job at Sharing Plow in New Jersey. New Jersey. Interesting. What was your first role, industry role? I was joining a group doing CNS stuff. I was working on schizophrenia and then on Alzheimer's. Okay. And I have never done pure CNS drug research since. And that is by choice because it's a fascinating field, but it is brutal. It is a black box inside a black box. I mean, the first compound I worked on was, was a schizophrenia candidate. 
It was a selective dopamine antagonist. And it was a really good molecule. It was very potent, very selective, great pharmacokinetics. It went exactly in the brain to the right spots. And I was very happy to have gotten in on the tail end of that project. It went off to the clinic and they gave it to phase one volunteers. They gave it to pretty high doses. It didn't do anything to them. Great. So they, then they went into real schizophrenics and they gave them up to pretty high doses and it didn't do anything to them either. Not a damn thing. They were just <laughs> as schizophrenic at the right. end of the study as they were at the start. And I was like, what, what? All the animal models that are predictive of efficacy were all saying this would work. And that's when it hit me. These models aren't worth a damn, are they? They're still not. Well, that's, that's where, you know, I spend a lot of time consulting and things like that and trying to bridge the gap with folks to start to say, we've got to stop relying on these animal models and start, just start now. Let's just start trying to build a parallel path. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then after that, I worked on Alzheimer's and my God, if you told me back in 1991, 92, that it would be the year 2020 and we would still be arguing about whether amyloid is the causative factor of Alzheimer's, I would not have been a very happy fellow. <laughs> got to tell you. Yeah. So no, I hear you. Uh, so I did CNS at Sharing Plow for, for eight years. Then I, I'd been looking around for somewhere else to go. And I went to Bayer in Connecticut and did nearly 10 years there working on metabolic disease, mostly diabetes. Uh -huh. And then Bayer merged, well, actually, they didn't really merge. They went out and bought um, German Sharing, Sharing AG of Berlin, and closed the entire West Haven research site down and threw about 600 of us out on the street. And then after that, it was like, okay, where am I going to go? So I tried to find jobs there, not happening. Um, no place wanted an experienced medicinal chemist. Either they weren't hiring at all or like Pfizer, they were letting experienced medicinal chemists right. go. Yeah. So we ended up moving up here to the Boston Cambridge area. And I told my wife, I said, well, you know, that way, if something goes wrong with this job, maybe I can find another without calling the moving trucks. Right. Yeah. Which 10 years later is what happened. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's been pretty volatile. And, and, and you know, we, we have these conversations every day. Well, why are, you know, from a software perspective, why are people worried that if they come in and use the software, they're going to lose their job or right. their group's going to lose their job? I said, you got to understand, it's been volatile for the past 30 years. You know, mm -hmm. I, when I worked for a certain company, I was the global head of informatics and I basically had a six month contract. I never <laughs> knew when the place was going to implode. So, and, yep. and it did a year later, right? Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's volatile and people get sensitive about it and you have to understand that. But in the same sense, I think scientists need to understand too, the complexity is so large that you can always work on something harder and yeah. let some of the, the new tools handle yeah. it. You know, as a chemist, you have a little, it's been, it's been rough, but as a chemist, you have a little bit of an edge in that we are more generalists than some of the other areas. I know when I was at Bayer, we got rid of osteoporosis as a therapeutic area. Well, the chemists who are working on osteoporosis projects just went off and worked on oncology projects or whatever. Right. The biologists who are experts at, at osteoclast and osteoblast cell culture, huh, they went into another company and found other jobs. Right. Because they, they had no skills that were needed anymore. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. I, I, I've, I've seen. Well, this is going to probably, you know, in your current role too, is in translational sciences, right? Is that where you're at today? Pretty much, yeah. I'm doing chemical biology, and over the years, I think I have actually turned from a medicinal chemist into a, a chemical biology person. Yeah, I over the years working at different pharma companies, I've, I've honed in on some of those folks that really expanded their repertoire and did quite well. You know, they, they, yeah. again, they had a personality similar to yours. They weren't afraid to learn more and more and take yeah. on more. You really have to, because I remember at one point at, at Bayer, we had a guy coming over from one of the big companies in New Jersey on a job interview. He had about eight or 10 years experience. So I remember we asked him, so, you know, how do you, how do you 
interact with the folks doing the primary assay for your project? He said, well, you know, I, I don't really see them. They're in another building and I don't go to those meetings. My boss goes to those meetings. I said, hmm, okay. Okay, how, how kind of interactions have you had with the folks doing formulations? Well, he didn't really see them either. And he didn't see the people during the talks, the toxicology. He didn't, he didn't know his boss went to those meetings. Specialization. And thinking, yeah, and I was thinking, buddy, you are crippling your career yeah. here. At eight or 10 years in, you should have better answers than this. Right. This is a, this is a really good point for the folks that are listening that are interested in this yeah. because um, it's uh, people, people say to me, John, how are you able to stay in Pennsylvania your whole career? Well, <laughs> I tried I tried to learn everything and everything and I I I wasn't afraid sometimes to get out of my comfort zone and uh try to scramble and learn something new and make it happen. Yeah. And I yeah. think I think it's really important because degrees are one thing, life and learning is a completely different yeah. thing. And these days with all the outsourcing of the past, you know, <clears throat> 10 15 years you really should be able to give them something they can't buy for cheaper in Bangalore or Chengdu. Uh -huh. And that often means the newer stuff, <clears throat> the weirder stuff that hasn't become as much of a commodity. And the other reason I think I got into chemical biology was I was starting to realize that medicinal chemistry was not necessarily for me anyway, where the rubber hit the road uh -huh. because we would do a great job on these projects and we'd come up with potent selective bioavailable compounds and we'd send them off and they'd die in phase two. Ah, pick right. the wrong target again. And after a few of those times, I got to thinking, you know, why is this? And I realized that the big problems of the industry, the 90% failure rate in the clinic, had not as much to do with medicinal chemistry and more to do with complex biology questions which needed chemistry to help answer them and this was where chemical biology really started to get a foothold <clears throat> so you have a bunch of people who are doing a little of each and i guess more importantly thinking in both of those realms at once yep now it's exactly part of the focus too and in the company that I started with the folks that I hired, like Ralph and Yolanda, we're like, we want to, before we leave this world or, or this industry, we want to see if we can put a dent into that failure rate. So that's something that oh, we're yeah. working on. That's the single biggest fact about the drug industry. I tell this to journalists all the time. I said, that's the one thing you got to understand. And there's, I don't think there's any other industry that has something like that. I mean, 90% of Boeing's airplanes leave the ground. 90% of Pizza Hut's pizzas are probably edible, but 90% of our drugs crash and burn and take right. all the money with them. Exactly, exactly. And the, the, the uh, working with a, a, a close group, the disparity between phase one, two, and then three is unbelievable, oh, right? Yeah. And so again, if you can um, just, that's just, it's unbelievable. When did you, when did you start writing? When did you start doing the, um, Oh yeah. Doing the blog. Yeah. Give us the, 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 the history yeah. of the blog. That was back in early 2002. The thing has been running ever since like January of 2002, which seems insane. If you told me back then that I, it would still be a going concern in 2020, I wouldn't believe you. I thought I was going to run out of stuff to write about for one thing. <laughs> shows you how much I know. But I had always been very quick to write a paper. Now, a scientific manuscript is a pain in the ass, no matter what. You can't just sit down and write that instantly. But if I had to write some kind of uh, summary or presentation, no problem. If I had to give up, get up and give an impromptu talk, no problem. Presentations like that. But those are not rate-limiting steps in drug discovery. They're helpful but it's not that helpful. And I thought to myself, you know, if I do have any, any abilities in this line, I should see if I should, could get more out of them. And it seemed like a fun thing to do, to just write this stuff and there's no barrier to entry. Right. So I started talking about drug discovery because every time I told someone what I did for a living, they'd be like, oh, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know people did that. Whoa, that's a neat job. So I, I, I took that as, a, as audience research. Right. And it so just kept going. And it just kept going. And then um, 
I'm just, it, it's so, it's interesting because it's kind of like this show that I started too. And, and I'm finding it's, it has legs as well. It's like, there's so many topics to talk about, but, you know, t tell us about some of the times where, what was the first controversial thing you wrote? If it wasn't the first mm -hmm. thing you wrote, but, but yeah. where you got a lot of heat maybe from people in the industry, colleagues, whatever, and yeah. how did you handle it? That's a good point. I mean, for quite a while, <clears throat> the readership was low enough where controversy was not a problem. I was just amazed. Like this people, show. <laughs> <laughs> I was just amazed that people were reading it at all. But yeah, I remember there were a few things. Um, if, if you speak up and say that you think that synthetic organic chemistry is not the forefront of chemistry in general, not kind of the queen of the chemical sciences, you get a lot of hate mail. Uh -huh. And I was considered kind of a traitor to the cause because that's what I'd done my PhD on. Another thing I remember happening was um, there was a little company out in Seattle that had a technology which to me sounded like digital homeopathy. In other words, it sounded like nonsense. And I wrote an article <clears throat> about them because they were out there trying to raise money from people with this weirdo record the molecular signal and then play it back into the water and it acts like the original drug that's literally their thing uh -huh. so i wrote an article about how idiotic that was and within a week or so i had a letter from their head legal counsel and he was going on about how no one at this company had ever endured anything so shocking to their sensibilities as my comments on their life's work and the trauma and the stress was just getting to everyone because of the cruel, vicious things I'd said. And he just knew that once I was made aware of all this, that I would be happy to retract all of these evil, libelous statements and issue a heartfelt apology. Otherwise, who knew what could happen? Who knows, right? Yeah, yeah you know how these letters go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I took a look at that. And for the next day's blog post, I reproduced his letter in full, <laughs> word for word, and added another extended commentary on it, basically telling him to buzz off and said that anyone making claims like they were making, I said, you are being fitted, whether you know it or not, for a red wig and a big clown nose. And your job is to try to avoid wearing them. You have other things to do with your time than harass people who write things about you on the internet. Go win the Nobel Prize that this work is right. pointing toward. Well, they haven't, obviously. Yeah. And I've been threatened several times over the years <clears throat> with lawsuits. And every time I've told people to buzz off. Now, on the same vein, did you ever get it wrong? Like where you were, not, not that, that you were... Um, harsh or anything like that but you 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 looked at something and you said no nah, no way and you, you know you wrote about it but maybe you didn't have all the data at the time or whatever but you know sometimes the the most game-changing things are right in front of you yeah. and you don't see it right yeah. but yeah any and any experiences like that there's things i've missed definitely that i should have written about and didn't there are things where i've let mistakes creep into the blog post and i'll just go back and correct it and when i do that I'll actually put a thing edited, you know, to make this yeah. clear or edited. I got this backwards because I don't want to be pulling the wool over people's eyes. Um, there have been things also I've changed my mind about mm -hmm. over the years. Um, when the ENCODE team a few years ago started publishing about how they thought that these big sections of the human genome that look like junk were actually functional, I wrote a few blog posts about how I was having a lot of trouble with that idea and why I was. And I wasn't the only one having trouble with it. But since then, it's become clear to me that I've had the need to expand my horizons because uh -huh. not only genetic sequences, but protein sequences, you have these like disordered proteins where they had this big, long, disordered tail. Well, some of them are disordered from, from nose to tail, but <clears throat> they'll have this big, long, disordered tail on them. And the sequence doesn't matter much. You can take the sequence and mix and match and rearrange it 
as long as it doesn't have an ordered structure, it's fine. Uh -huh. It's just fine. I wouldn't have believed that at the, you know, years before. Well, it's counterintuitive to, to at it's least what you were taught and experienced. Yeah, it's counterintuitive. And it's not something I was ready for. And as far as the genetic sequence stuff goes, some of that stuff is important because it's a spacer, not because of the particular sequence that's written mm -hmm. into the spacer, but it's a physical spacer between various other elements of the genome, and it needs to be the size it is. <clears throat> right. So if you get rid of it, you're in trouble. But if you keep it and just rearrange some random letters in and out, <laughs> that's no problem. Yeah. So I've had to I've had to rethink some of my some of my preconceptions on stuff like that. Well, I mean, it's a tough task too because of the complexity of biology and what we don't know. You know, oh, we yeah. hard we hardly know anything. Jesus, and, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's another thing I tell journalists is that you have no idea how little we know about what we're doing. Yeah, I'm surprised any drugs work. <laughs> Well, when I worked in some pharma companies, I thought we were in the moving business of moving desks around the, the uh, facility versus <laughs> discovering drugs. So, oh, boy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you know, people have tried so many organizational schemes over the years. Um, decentralizing into independent units, recentralizing hierarchies, flattening the organization. Everything. This is critical. This is a great conversation right here because I've struggled with this for years. And people keep doing this stuff. And I'm in my 30th year now. I've seen some of these come around more than once. Yeah. It's like when you see, oh, yeah, people were wearing those kind of jeans when I was in high school. Here they are again. <laughs> it's the same thing. And you see it more than once. And I've come to think that there apparently is no perfect R&D structure because someone would have stumbled across it and everyone would everyone would have imitated it by now. No, we're still all just wandering around hoping that there's got to be something better than the structure we have, for God's sake. Right. I think the problem is size in large companies, mm -hmm. right? There is a, a book, I forget the title of it, years ago, where the, it studied Native American populations. And once a Native American population, a village got over like 500 occupants, it started to break down. So they would butt off and then break it in half and go move uh, away. And then the culture would return and it would be a happy, happier, more yeah. operational village. And I think that's, for me, that's why I think we've struggled with so time because we can't deal with the organizational complexity that sets in when you start to get out of control as a big yeah. company. Yeah. It's also so hard to rate performance and figure out who's being productive and who isn't? I mean, some people you can tell, but for a lot of folks, what do you do with the person who's not so productive this year or the next, but every three or four or five years, they come up with something amazing. Right. What do you do with them? And there's a lot of those people in the sciences. Ab absolutely. Yes. But if you are, if you're going to do a, a, an idiotic Jack Welch at GE rank and yank, we're going to clear out the bottom 10% of the dead, whatever year, you're going to get rid of all of your best thinkers if you do that for several Correct. years in a row. Well, that's the biotech industry. Uh, half of those people go and get involved in a small agile company. Yep. And there's no, there's a less amount of constraint on them. They're thinking, they're being analytical and bam, they get bought for billions of dollars by their previous employer. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's true. And the other problem I have with the performance ranking is that, I've worked at companies where they tried to force a bell curve distribution. And the problem is people's performance in an organization like this is not a normal distribution. Uh -uh. The normal distribution is what you'd get if you hired 800 random people, but you didn't, <laughs> did you? You put time and effort into thinking about who you're going to hire. So it's a lot more like, well, this is something I got from Bill James, the, uh, the baseball statistics writer back mm -hmm. in the 80s. There's apparently like a lot of people in this world who had their thinking about stuff changed by reading Bill James baseball abstracts in the eighties. Yeah. And I'm one of them because in this one, he talked about, look at the distribution of talent on a major league roster. You have a few stars, you have a bunch of people who are really damn good. And then by the time you get out to the far end of the curve, it hasn't gone like that. You're still 
it's the right hand slice of a much larger bell curve. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is the largest proportion of people are just good enough to stay in the league. So those people, you can swap in and out, and you might as well swap for someone younger because they might improve. Right. A 15-year major league veteran who's right at that level is not going to improve. So that was his thing about trading and building a roster. But I thought about that with drug companies. Yeah, you have some people who had great years. You have some people who had pretty damn good years. You have a whole bunch of people who had perfectly reasonable years. But you don't have very many who had God awful, what the hell were you thinking of years? But doesn't it bother you that the R&D industry, and I have to be careful how I say this because I work for a lot of them, right? But doesn't it bother you that they haven't figured this out in all these years? That management, and I'm generalizing, of course. Some of them have. Some of them have. Some of them have, yeah. And there's been, I have to say, in recent years, there seems to have been more of a de-emphasis on your department must have x number of each rating kind of thing that used to really really piss me off because i'd want to rate one of my associates this and they come back so no your associate isn't that they're this yeah why are they that because they have to be right so there's it's the most bit. demotivating method in the world and it i really i have for years lobbied to get rid of it let the managers manage it and yeah. we give us some sort of parameters but let us manage it yeah. um and and yeah so it's it's oh, it's a pro it's a big problem and it is, uh it's it a shame is. because like you said me, babies get thrown out with the bathwater. I, I remember telling one of the people working for me i said well i said here's your 0.78 percent raise that's what you get for a meets expectations around here this year don't spend yeah. it all in one place i said as for me i said i got a 0.81 percent raise so you know you can tell i'm more valuable yeah i i've actually said to somebody why don't you keep this and donate it to some sort of charity because they're going to need it more than i do yeah here's a great question if you want to answer it how have you been able to get all the different companies over the years to let you do your blog or buy ah. into it <laughs> well when i started it i was at bayer and no one had heard of a blog they especially had never heard of a blog back at the mothership in germany so after I'd been doing it for a bit, I said, you know, I should actually let someone know I'm doing this because God knows no one else knows. So I talked to my boss at the time and he said, well, as long as you're doing this on your own time, I mean, we can't tell you what to do with your time. He said, you're not talking about anything we're doing. I said, no, of course not. So he actually advised me to go over and talk to the folks in legal. Well, I knew them real well because I'd worked on patents with them. They, they were okay with me. So they said, yeah, as long as you're not seen as a corporate spokesman, and as long as you're not talking about anything proprietary, you know, and you're not going to be a disgrace to the company, what the hell? So I said, could you write that up and stick it in my file? And they did, yeah. you know. And after that, by the time I finished up at Bayer, the blog was well known enough where it actually got me in the door at my next company. Right. Well, so, they got to see your pragmatism and how you looked at things, yeah. obviously. I have to say, since, I've, since the blog got some readership, I have gotten an offer every time I've gone on a job interview, and that's just because it's pre-screened. Anyone who wants to have me in can read the blog and see what I've done and what I'm interested in and how I think. And if they think that's something they'd like, they have me in. And when they have me in, God knows it's pretty much like being stuck in an elevator with the blog being played on a tape recorder. <laughs> so what you see is what you get. And if they don't think that's what they need, they don't even have me in. Got it. Interesting. There's a question of, uh, has anyone ever complained about a particular post that you might have done? Yeah, you know, yeah, we're talking about the controversy. I've had legal threats. <laughs> and I've had people who think that if I talk about paper who feel I was too harsh on it, or feel that they also have done stuff like that and weren't getting enough credit. Sometimes I'll look at it and I'll say, you know, you're right. And I'll go back and revise a little bit, but sometimes it just seems like sour grapes. So yeah, I don't get too many complaints, but there have been some over the years, but there's nothing that's, oh my God, I have to deal with this right now kind of complaint other than the occasional lawsuit threat. Yeah. So none from your employers. No one said, hey, you never got pulled in and spanked, like slapped for that or anything. Not really. Not Good. really. Um, I have had corporate communications people kind of laugh nervously. <laughs> about what was going on but 
as I say, the last two, the last two jobs I've had, they knew what they were getting into when they hired me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. What technology or science and industry are you most excited about? Oh yeah, that's a good question. There's a lot of them. I really like the way that cryo EM is advancing in structural biology. That's terrific stuff. And now we're doing, you know, we're heading toward actually getting structures inside cells with cryo EM tomography. Right. I like that a lot. I like all the things that mass spec can do for you. Mass spec has just been gradually taking over the world during my entire career. And the, these enable the sorts of chemical biology stuff I like to do. And that I think is where we're going to actually understand more about basic drug mechanisms. Uh -huh. We still can't tell you what the concentrations of our drugs are inside a cell. We can't. No one believes me outside the industry. Everyone in the industry knows it, but no one believes me outside the industry when I tell them that they, well, you can't. I said, yep. And if you want to know what the concentration is in the various parts of the cell, <laughs> forget it. Right. So we've got a lot of basic questions that are going to have to be answered. And I really like the fact that so much analytical technology is getting so much better. Now, modeling is another thing, but I'm a long-term optimist and short-term pessimist about modeling. I see no reason why modeling and molecular modeling shouldn't be able to do what we all want it to do. But if someone walks in next week and tells me they've solved it, I'm going to keep my hand on my wallet because I don't believe that either. Yeah, I mean, and, and there was a joke in there by the concentration with focus and things like that, but I, we don't have time for the joke. So, But you are right about the modeling, and, and it's my personal belief that – we don't have enough model quality data. So we, we've kind of missed the mark over the past 20 years of, of not only capturing and, and contextualizing our data and securing it as an asset like financial institutions mm -hmm. do with currency. We're now, you know, we would be five, six, seven years ahead if our data assets were model quality um, yeah, from a modeling perspective, but we're not. And so now companies. we're trying to play catch up. Yeah, a lot of big companies have been realizing this and are trying to get data quality initiatives and all that together. But it's true. You know, that gets into the topic of AI and machine learning. As you know, it's like painting a wall. They tell you to spend like, you know, three times as much effort preparing the surface. you got to spend three times as much time curating your data and getting it ready for your machine learning model. You're just going to get garbage. Right. Amazing amounts of plausible garbage. So... A few years ago, I had the chance to talk with folks at IBM when they were pushing their Watson for drug discovery, which, of course, they've dropped like a radioactive potato now. And I asked them, they, they were talking about turning it loose on PubMed and letting it go through the whole medical literature and coming up with amazing connections. I said, what are you going to do about the fact that at least a third of PubMed is garbage? And they're like, oh, well, yeah, well, yeah, we're aware of that. And I said, I didn't ask if you were aware of it. I asked what you're going to do about it, and we never got that far. Right. So this is, this, is, this is getting to the crux of actually the things that I'm trying to fix in the industry, mm. me and a whole boatload of other people, but the, it starts in academia, and I know academia has been trying to fix the reproducibility and replication issues, right. um, you know, garbage in, garbage out, people not doing things properly, the rigor that's missing, all that, but it's creeped in or crept into R&D industry. And um, mm -hmm. believe it or not, there's still a ton of re-experimentation. There's mm -hmm. things aren't fair or findable, accessible, interoperable, and especially reproducible because the data is just not yeah. there. Yeah, and the we have all these issues that we shouldn't have. And yeah. well, people are asking me, where did it start? And I'm like, I don't know. I thought, it's, I thought we had it solved in the 90s, but then after the dot-com bubble, it just seemed to get really bad. No, it's true. And the person who ran the assay is gone. And yeah, it's gotten better, but it's not where it should be. It, it's, it's true. It's, it's like when you have to write a paper on a project for J. Midcam or something, and half the people who are on the project have left, and no one can remember why you made that compound. And <laughs> this whole exactly. series. How come we didn't follow up on that? Geez, it looks great. What happened to that? Right. Which is why J. Midcam is a temple of lies in a way, because everyone applies the narrative filter to their projects and makes everything look a lot more coherent and organized than it ever was. Right. That's, that's really, that's really interesting feedback. Um, let me ask you, there's another question. Are you okay on time? Yeah, fine. I told you it might go over. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Do you believe in the promise of digital biology? 
Yeah, if I know what you mean by digital biology, it's a little bit like we were talking about the AI stuff. The tricky part is, is that something like machine learning will not give you knowledge you didn't have. It will reveal knowledge you didn't know you had, connections in the data you have, but if you don't have enough data. So for example, there is no way that you're going to be able to model or simulate or machine learn your way to the etiology of Alzheimer's. We don't know enough. There's, if you remember an ancient Isaac Asimov science fiction story, there is insufficient data for a meaningful answer. So we need more information. And now if digital biology is trying to do simulation, then we need to know more to make a realistic simulation. If it's trying to use real world data that we have and get conclusions out of it, I like that a lot, but like we were just talking about, that real world data has got to be in beautiful, pristine shape before you turn the software loose on it or you run the risk of just getting fantasies out of it. Right. It's interesting. I mean, and I've noticed of some of the folks that I'm working with right now, the deep learning algorithms are improving and they are getting slight edges on things. However, it's exactly what you said. We don't know what we don't know. So how are we going to, how are we going to suggest that the next steps or predict the next steps? It's, exactly. it's like, it's like weather. Deep learning would not have helped you discover CRISPR. Deep learning would not have helped you discover sil RNA silencing. Deep learning would not have helped you discover the fact that there are biomolecular condensate droplets inside cells. None of those things, because we didn't know about any of these things. Now, what will really impress me is when we have the ability, or when our software has the ability, to look through a huge corpus of data and say, you know what? There's something missing. There is a hole shaped like this puzzle piece in this body of knowledge. And if there were something that fits into this, that would be great. There was, a, there was an old science fiction novel, uh, Stand on Zanzibar by John Brunner, where someone was querying an intelligent computer like that. And they were talking about this one society that everything seemed to be working better than it should, given their level of poverty and development and all that. And the fellow was questioning this intelligent computer and they, he did, it didn't have enough information. They said, and it was actually starting to break down because of this. And finally he said, could there be some sort of factor at work that is not in the data we have? If there were some sort of factor, is there some meaningful factor that, that you could design that would fit into this? That would be the fudge factor to make everything come out right. And the intelligent AI answers, yes, there is. They said, good. I stipulate that there is such a thing. And I want you to work on that basis. And that resolved its existential problem. Said also, tell us some designs of what this fudge factor would look like. What would it be to make things come out? So when a, when a machine can look at our corpus of data and say, you know what, this would make sense if it turned out that cells actually concentrated parts of their mechanisms in a reversible manner in weird little micro droplets. That would really make all this make more sense. I would be impressed by that. Right. Yeah, I don't know to that extent, but I did talk to a company this week that is trying to do what exactly you said. Look for the, that puzzle piece that's missing. Oh. And, and then how could we extrapolate or make Good sense out of that? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. But I, 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 in the end, I, I think I think it's good that we're being critical on things, but we are on a journey, right? And and I and I, I I always try to be careful. Like people say, like, oh, that piece of software, it's 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 a piece of junk now, and and maybe <laughs> it is, but when it was first developed, yeah. it was cutting edge. It, we yeah. have to start somewhere. Like exactly. all these models, all the things that we're doing, if they're all in their infancy. Yes. And, and you could just look at the iPhone as an example from what it looked like originally to where we're at now, right? No, we're, If you we're, went to use the first one, you'd be like, get this thing out of my hand. Exactly. This thing's, it yeah. But so it, we're on this journey. And I think if we can all realize that um, and then realize how complex all this really is yeah. and how much we don't know. Right, right. And that's what keeps everyone employed. You know, not everyone. Some of us aren't. Right. But <clears throat> it keeps everyone employed is that 
there is so much unknown out there. And, you know, you're asking me earlier about, you know, the kind of attitude I had growing up. I'm not fit for any other kind of work now. <clears throat> I'm not fit for any kind of job where I know what's going to happen next. I wouldn't be able to stand it. Yeah. I, I've had, I've had decades now of looking at stuff going, what the heck? How, what, how could that? Oh gosh. And having to rethink everything. Right. I'm used to that now. Nothing else will do. That's, 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 that's pretty awesome. Um, did you, have you ever written anything on blockchain or, uh, I won't call blockchain a hype, but have you addressed hype in our industry and, and the yeah. damage it does? It does. No, I haven't written, written anything on blockchain. So any of my thoughts on blockchain are just going to be useless. And I'm sorry, I can't, I can't help okay. out there, but, but as far as hype, yeah. And I mean, it's just human nature. Um, when I think, when I joined Sharing Plow in 89, the big hype was molecular modeling and, and computer-aided drug design. They had just cleared out a room and stuffed it full of Evans and Sutherland workstations, if you remember this era, and they'd put a sign over it, C-A-D-D, for computer-aided drug design. Well, the guys across the hall in the MedCam labs didn't like that much, so they put a sign over their doors that said B-A-D-D, bad, brain-assisted drug design. <laughs> and that was the hype, though, was that we were actually going to be able to do this and of course, it's been a long journey. But you had that, then you had uh, the combi chem explosion. Hey, we don't know how these drugs bind. We don't care. We're going to make 50 million of them next Tuesday. And then you had all sorts of other things that have come along that were going to revolutionize drug discovery. And each one of them is useful and turns into a tool. But all of them have gone through that hype cycle of, oh my God, finally the answer. Well, it's not. Nothing's the final answer. Yeah, it gets back to your your um, description of baseball and and stacking the team. If you're going to win that championship, you got to have the right team. And we've said this in a couple of the shows now, where it's the ultimate team sport. What we do, and if you have a, a dysfunctional team, you're probably not going to win the championship. Yeah. yeah, and people need to realize they're on a team too. That's right, exactly. For some folks coming in from really high-powered organic synthesis groups and joining industry, because in, in academia, this kind of chemistry is, is like the Metro Goldwyn Mayer motto, Ars Gratia Artis, art for art's sake. You do it because you can, because it's there. Well, that's not the case in industry, of course. You're doing it to do something, to make a drug. And if they could find a way to make a drug and not have to pay any of us chemists, they'd do it in an instant. Right. They'd drop us. We are expensive, time-wasting. We waste streams we've got a lot of disadvantages but they can't do without us so you have to realize that chemistry is not a, a an explanation by itself neither is the biology without the biologist the chemists wouldn't know if we wouldn't know if our compounds did anything without us they wouldn't have any compounds to test right and you really have to realize what your place in the world is you are a piece of the puzzle that's that's that could be the the final the final part of the segment here i think i'll leave it at that i won't say anything else <laughs> i think it was great thanks so much i I, I, I know for a fact based off all the questions and the feedback already that uh, everybody loved this someone even suggested we need to get him back on one more time <laughs> oh, we I didn't hear it all <laughs> oh yeah if he thinks that you've only heard some of my stories this is correct i i told you guys i grew up in the south i have stories that i can go on for hours all right. Well, thanks so much, Derek. Uh, this has been great and good luck with everything. And we all Thank look you. forward to reading your next uh, blog article. Yep. It's, it's coming out Monday morning, just like every Monday. Okay. All right. Thanks. Again. All right. Terry, have a great weekend, everybody. Bye. Bye.